Happy Sabbath, everyone. Praise the Lord. I'm happy to be with you guys once again. I always get nervous when I have to sing. I do every time. And I don't even really like singing by myself. I really don't. Um, I'm singing. Oh, let me take a deep breath. Okay. We're singing a medley this morning. I like to call it the faithfulness medley. And so there are going to be songs in it that you know. And it's not like an upbeat medley. It's a slower paced one, but songs that you recognize. And as we sing... I want you to sing with me. I want you to sing in your heart. I want you to meditate on the words. And I want us to enter into a time of worship as we prepare our hearts and our minds to receive the sermon. Amen? All right. Then this helps me because if we are all on one accord worshiping, then I won't be by myself. And that makes me feel really good. But for your grace, I not be saved but for your grace I'd go my way I'm forever grateful you have been so faithful to me Lord your amazing grace great is thy faithfulness oh God my Turning with thee, thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not as thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness. to my heart so I'm gonna sing it through twice and hopefully you'll learn it because it's real easy but it, may, I mean, it makes me want to cry sometimes I'm not I'm not gonna cry this morning but it's just so powerful the words of it to me great is your mercy toward me your loving kindness toward me Great is thy faith 
song is awesome. You've been And mercy, I see. There were times when I, I questioned your will. I've even failed. I failed to believe. But you've been faithful. You've been faithful. This is a testimony for me because I mean, no, some of y'all never tr failed on God. Never y'all, y'all always trusted Him and you never doubted Him. But that won't me. And it was not me. And so when I think of the words, you've been faithful. You've been faithful to me. I didn't do anything to deserve His faithfulness. Looking back, only your mercy. times in my life I questioned your will I even failed to believe but you've been faithful you've been faithful to me Amen God is good, amen? amen? It is awesome to come together and worship our God, but it's also nice to come together and fellowship with each other, amen? All right. My sermon title for this morning is, Does God Receive Your Best? Does God Receive Your Best? Very simple sermon this morning. If you could custom tailor the worship service to be exactly the way you want it to be, I'm sure we all have a thousand different opinions on that, but what would it look like? What would you change? What, what would you add? What would you take away from the worship service if it could be exactly spot on what you're looking for in a church service? I suppose that some would make it more upbeat. They would probably have an array of musical instruments. There would be more verbally out loud praising God. There may even be some hand raising. Some would prefer, possibly, that we dress a little more casually, that we're not so, you know, formal, as it were. And then there are those who would love to see the service be much more solemn. In other words, so you can hear a pin drop. You know, uh, some people like the service to be almost like a funeral, where you, don't, you can't so much as even breathe. Well, you can breathe, but do it very quietly. <laughs> don't do it very loudly. I heard the story of a paramedic who was being interviewed by a news reporter, and, and the news reporter said, tell me about the most interesting call that you've ever been on. Paramedic said, that's easy. That's the call I went on down there at 11th and Walnut. So, yeah, well, what was interesting about that call? And he said, well, one of the deacons at the church down on the corner down there called and said that a man right in the middle of the service had fallen over and passed out. And so we rushed down there. And he said, well, you're a paramedic. You probably see that all the time. What makes that so interesting? He said, well, we carried out four other people who were asleep before we found the man that had passed out. <laughs> Nobody likes a dead, lifeless church, amen? <laughs> Including God. I don't even think ultra-conservative people like a dead church. They just think it's supposed to be that way. I don't believe anybody likes a dead church. 
The Bible says that we are to worship our God in spirit and in truth. It doesn't mean that we go crazy and roll around on the floors. I've shared my experience about going to a church like that once before. But it does mean that we show up with passion and with love in our hearts for our God. That we don't just go through the motions of worship without experiencing God's presence and renewal. So maybe, maybe to ask how you would like the worship service or how I would like the worship service, maybe that's asking the wrong question altogether. Maybe the right question is, how would God like the worship service to be? How would God like his people to be in the worship service? What does God want you and want me to get out of the worship service? Maybe that is the question that we need to ask this morning. Today we're going to see a passage of scripture that talks about worshiping God. We serve an awesome God, amen? Amen. The great I am, the lion of the tribe of Judah. There's no one like him, an awesome God. We'll be spending our time today in Malachi chapter 1. It's the last book in the Old Testament. If you could please turn there with me. Malachi chapter 1. In Malachi chapter 1, the chapter begins while you're turning there. It begins by God talking about his great love for his people. Do you know that God loves you? Do you really know that? I'm not talking about the cliche, yeah, Jesus loves me, this I know. I'm talking about you really know that God loves you. That he's really interested with what's going on in your life. God talks about that in the beginning of chapter 1. He says, I love my people. But then, he moves on to asking some tough, pointed questions to the priest who were leading the worship during that time. Malachi chapter 1. Before we jump into this, as always, you know we need to pray. Since we're getting into God's word. Let's bow our heads. Lord God, this morning we ask for the power of the Holy Spirit to be here. I pray that, Lord, we won't just go through the motions. I don't believe we have been up to this point. But I pray that, Lord, today your name would be high and lifted up. That each of us would consider our responsibility. Since we have such an awesome God. You, Lord. The God that's above all things. All people. Everywhere. Thank you for being our God. In the name of Jesus, all the people said, Amen. Amen. All right. First, giving God our best means we worship Him with what church? Reverence. You know, I've got to admit something to you this morning. That was a taboo word for me for a long time. I didn't like that word when I was younger. Didn't care for it. Because, you see, we had some... I don't know, some very, very conservative people in our church who were always flogging people with the word reverence. You're not being reverent enough. If you did anything different, that's not reverent. I didn't like that word. They seem to use it to push people, force people, get people to go into strict obedience and submission. But when I got older, I realized that the word reverence is not a bad word at all. In fact, I don't think that you can truly honor God, that I can truly honor God without some degree of reverence in our hearts. It just can't happen. God deserves and expects reverence to be shown to his holy name and presence. To enter into worship and expect that you're going to get anything out of it, that I'm going to get anything out of it without reverence is a joke. It's not going to happen. You'll be looking at your watch. You'll be thinking about the way your stomach is growling. You'll be, "Mm, is it time for this to be over yet? i got better things to do. You'll be thinking about the next greatest thing you're going to do today. When in fact, you're doing the greatest thing, is worshiping God. So look with me now in Malachi chapter 1, and let's go to verse 6. Malachi 1 and verse 6, are you there? All right, a son honors his father, and a servant his master. If I am the father, where is my honor? And if I'm a master, where is my reverence? 
says the Lord of hosts, to you priests who despise my name, yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? In other words, what are you talking about? (laughs) You know, many years ago while I was still serving at the police department, the then president was going to go to the war memorial here in Bedford, just down the road. And you know, we planned for that thing for several weeks. We had to get everything ready. You have to have a place to take the president. If somebody would try to attack him, you rush him off to a certain safe place and and this and that. Our cars had to be spotless. They had to look nice. We had to wear our dress uniforms. I was assigned to block a roadway off or an intersection, a side street. And when the president went by, I stood there like this. And when he passed, I did like that and saluted him. And he was waving at me when he went by. We did everything we could to roll out the red carpet for that man. But hear me, church, he's just a man. The current president, he's just a man. The next president, whoever that might be, is just a man. Sorry, ladies, could be a woman. Don't men, don't you go get uncomfortable. We don't know. But it's just a human being. What about God? What about God? When we fail to give God our best, when we have a lack of reverence and respect for his holy name, he's displeased. In fact, in the passage that we're studying this morning, he accuses the priest of despising his name. Despising his name. You know, I found that the times in my life when I've strayed away from God, one of the first things that I lost was reverence. One of the first things I lost was a sense that he was still there. Because, you know, sin has a way of separating you from God. There were some occasions during that time when I was actually attending church, although it was very sporadic. That is until my grandmother got a hold of me. But church meant nothing. Going to church, actually, there was a pretty girl there. I like to go see that pretty girl. Sorry, Brendan. Um, <clears throat> but other than that, church was going through the motions. I guess I helped sing the songs. I certainly didn't get much out of being there. And in Malachi chapter 1, that's exactly what was happening. You see, the priest had let the standard slip down low. Worship meant almost nothing. They were just going through the motions, just going through the throes of religion. But when you stop and consider that God had called Israel to be his people, he had called them, he had liberated them, he had fought for them, he had done so much for them, and now they had almost completely forgotten him. The religion... Their worship was a husk. It was a form. There was no deep-seated emotion. There was no passion. There was no meaning to it. How about you? How about me? What do you get out of worship? What does worship mean to you? Is it routine or something you have to do? At, well, it's you know, Sabbath. I better get up and go to church. I think I'll sleep in a little longer and show up about time for the sermon. Is it that attitude or is it, I can't wait to get to church. God, today is going to be an awesome day. I know that God is going to be at church. I know that I'm going to receive a blessing today. You know, Christ has done a lot for us, hasn't he? He's given us life. He's our creator. He died for us. He's our Redeemer. We don't walk through this old wicked sinful world alone. He's with us always. He sends us the Holy Spirit. He's done so much. How can we think of coming to church? How can we think of worshiping Him and just going through the motions and not getting anything out of it? How can we think of that? You see... God still today, just like in Malachi's day, desires reverence. 
He desires respect. He desires that we praise his name. He wants all those things. In Malachi's day, God had specifically called, he was calling out the priest. Why? Because he had chosen those men to be his representatives. To represent him before the people. To teach them obedience to God. To teach them about salvation. He charges them with despising his name. With careless, half-hearted worship. Worship that lacked reverence for the power and presence of God Almighty. Now don't misunderstand. I think sometimes in my mind in the past I got it confused. You see, I thought reverence was a very quiet, solemn worship service where nobody made a sound. But I've revised my thinking because I think reverence can be quite loud sometimes. I think it can. In fact... When you go back through the Old Testament and you're looking at their, when they're worshiping God around the temple there, when they're worshiping God around the sanctuary, they're playing all kinds of musical instruments. They're praising God. Do you think that was quiet? I think reverence can be loud. I don't think the service has to be a funeral to have reverence. Nadab and Abihu got a little confused about what God was looking for in worship. They tried to offer God careless, half-hearted worship. And did he accept it? He rejected it. He rejected them, in fact, as well. He was forced to exercise accelerated judgment because in their position, they could have led scores of people astray. They could have caused the people to lose all respect for God, to to lose all respect for worship and the meaning of worship. You see, careless, half-hearted worship actually turns people away from God. It doesn't bring them to Him. It causes them to make God, to put Him in a box and make Him whatever you want Him to be. Where there's a lack of reverence for God, there's a lack of love and understanding of God. But on the other hand, when we have reverence for God, there's going to be meaningful, soul-stirring worship. You know, I loved when Michelin came up here. She sang song after song. I've really sensed we were worshiping God. When the praise team is up here singing, I sense that we're really worshiping God. It's amazing. God desires us to worship in such a way that will transform us into His image. Worship's an integral part of that transformation. It moves our heart. It brings reformation and revival. It causes us to be alive spiritually and engaged with the great I Am. You know, I was talking to some family a year or so ago, I don't know, it was a while back. And they were telling me about a church they attended. No church around here. It was up in the big city. It wasn't an Adventist church even. But it was like a smorgasbord of churches. You know, it's kind of like when you go to Subway. You say, uh, yeah, I want some lettuce. Um, I want some tomato and, yeah, mushrooms and green peppers. That's kind of how this church was. You, you see, you, you look in the program, and you pick the type of service you want. You pick what you're looking for, and you go to that service. And I was completely blown away when they were telling me about the children's service, Melanie. It was quite interesting. You go in the, the kids' service, and they have pool tables. They have video games. They have anything you can imagine is there to entertain the kids. They were telling me that they even brought in a big cage and they put two motorcyclists inside of it right in the middle of the service and they were riding those motorcycles around there just like at the circus or something. (laughs) But you know, some churches have attempted to entertain people into the church. Because of the waning interest in church by so many, they assume, well, hey, we're going to make it like a program. We're going to make it like a, a TV show people are watching. 
In fact, I've heard of churches that have different themes each week and, and all this. They even play movie clips from popular TV shows and, and movies during the service. They assume they have to do that stuff as well to keep people coming back for more. But entertainment in and of itself is not what God has asked us to do. In fact, when all we're doing is entertaining people, the service is really about us. It's not about God. It's about us. It's about pleasing ourselves and pleasing other people. Don't misunderstand. I'm not espousing an ultra-conservative worship service or anything like that because I'm not there. I hope you aren't either. But what I am talking about is good, lively worship and music. As I indicated last week, I don't believe the early Adventist pioneers had dead worship services. In fact, I think sometimes you and I might be a little uncomfortable if we had attended some of those worship services. We'd be like, man, are they going Pentecostal or something? What's going on here? And let's be honest. When somebody comes up front and sings, we enjoy it, don't we? It's got a degree of an entertainment value to it even, doesn't it? Let's be honest. Come on. Is there anything wrong with that? I don't think so. You see, I believe when the worship service is targeted on God, when it's focused on God, it actually uplifts us and draws us to God. There's nothing wrong with that. But if we ever come to the place where all we want to do is entertain people, we've missed the mark. And, listen now, got to balance this thing out a little bit. If we ever come to the place where all we do is bore people to tears, put them to sleep, we've also missed the mark. God doesn't want that kind of worship either. Look at Psalms verse, chapter 89, verse 7. God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in what church? Reverence by all those around Him. Christ has commanded us to lead people to Him, to teach them about Him, to lift Him up. Not the church up, not what we can give them, but lift Christ up. That will keep them coming back for more. Maybe you're saying, Mike, I hear what you're saying and I agree, it sounds great, but I'm just not feeling it. It's just not there. In fact, some might even say, I'm not feeling it in this church. Hope you're not saying that. But if you are, let the change begin with you. Let the change begin with you. You see, if your heart's not right, if your heart's not in it, don't expect anybody else's to be either. Remember that the priest, the people in Malachi's day, didn't even know there was a problem. They thought they had it nailed. We're doing church, God. We're doing exactly what you said to do. God shows up and says, no, you're despising my name. You're taking away glory and honor from me. Let's make sure we don't do that at the Lynchburg Seventh-day Adventist Church. Amen? Amen. Second, giving God our best means bringing Him a sacrifice. Bringing Him a sacrifice. Listen, God is never pleased with half-hearted, half-baked sacrifices. Are you with me? He's never pleased by that. Look at verses 7 and 8. He's talking to the priest now. You offer defiled food on my altar, but say, in what way? Have we defiled you? By saying the table of the Lord is contemptible. And when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you favorably? Says the Lord of hosts. You know, a year or so ago, I upgraded my phone. I don't think it's any secret that I'm an Apple guy. Pretty proud of that. 
but I upgraded my phone. And you know, they got this funny looking little cord that comes with the phone. And when I got the new phone, you know, you, when you open the box, I was like, how in the world did they get that stuff in there? It's perfectly wrapped up in just a certain way. And if, unless you're a machine or something, you can't get it back in the box. So I had an old cord that I'd been using, but it was one of those cords where I guess I jerked on it one too many times or tripped over it or something, and the insulation had started coming away from the plug, and you could see wires sticking out. <laughs> but it was still working, so I was like, hey, I just won't touch right there. It'll be fine. It'll be good. But then I got to thinking. I'd had this, this phone for several weeks, and I thought, you know, I got that old phone sitting around. I know these phones sell really well on Craigslist. I'm going to put it on there. So I did. I put it on there. Some lady hit on it within just a day or something, wanted to buy the phone. But when it was time to go meet her, the only two cords that I could find was the damaged cord and the brand new cord in the box that was wrapped up perfectly. It's like, well, I can't give her the damaged cord. And I don't want to give her the brand new cord. That's the one I paid all that money for. But I knew I had another cord somewhere else. So I tore the house apart, called the lady and said, I'm running late, and found that other cord and took it to her. But you know, with the children of Israel, it was always supposed to be perfect when you brought a sacrifice. There was supposed to be no defective sacrifices. There was supposed to be no half-hearted, half-baked sacrifice. When you're bringing an animal, no defect, defects at all. No blindness, no lameness, nothing. It was supposed to be perfect. It was supposed to be your best. Sadly, the people had resorted to bringing the ones they no longer wanted. I've got to clear that thing out anyway. Let's take it to the sanctuary and sacrifice it. But you know... As I was thinking about it, a sacrifice isn't really a sacrifice unless there's a degree of self-denial in the mix, right? Because if I don't want it and I just give it to God, how's that a sacrifice? Doesn't mean anything. It's like, here, God, get rid of that for me. The priest had become quite careless. Oh, you got a lame animal? Bring it on over. We'll sacrifice it. Oh, is it that animal blind? Well, he can see a little bit. Bring him on over. We'll take him. They were disobeying God. They were being unfaithful to the ritual law. Just like Cain could not understand why God would not accept his sacrifice, they couldn't understand why there was a problem. Here Abel obeys God. He, he brings exactly what God says. God accepts it. But Cain comes along and says, no, 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 no. If I'm going to bring you something, God, I'll do it. But it's going to be exactly what I want. Exactly the way I want. Nadab and Abihu were insistent as well on doing things their own way. Throughout the Bible, we find a reoccurring message. God accepts sacrifices brought in accordance with his word. He rejects sacrifices that are brought in a disobedient fashion. The animal sacrifices were supposed to be filled with meaning. Think about what they were supposed to represent. Christ himself, the spotless lamb of God that was going to come into the world. What an abomination to bring a defective sacrifice. Thankfully, we don't have to do that stuff anymore. Praise God. But to honor God, we still need to bring a sacrifice to Him. Sacrifice is important. Sacrifices are important to God. They're very important. The sacrifice God wants today is you and me. Our lives, our bodies. See, don't think He doesn't want to sacrifice. He does. Romans 12.1 makes it clear. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a what, church? A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your what kind of service? 
Paul's like, man, God has done so much for you. Are you kidding me? That's reasonable. That's nothing compared to what God's done for you. God still today desires that we bring him sacrifice, a living sacrifice. That means we do everything we can to keep our bodies healthy. God wants to transform us into his image, doesn't he? We fight against that plan when we're careless with our bodies. When we're careless and we sit down and fill our minds up with anything and everything that comes on the TV. That means we need to eat healthy. We need to exercise. We need to spend regular time in God's Word and prayer. Filling our minds up with God's Word. Now let's be honest, we live in a world that's bent on destroying our bodies. That's bent on destroying our minds. You know, I'm just blown away by the commercials that come on TV with my daughter sitting there. I'm like, man, I've got to change the channel or turn it off. Even on some of the channels, you would never expect that, see that, some of that stuff. It's just junk on there. God is working to restore us into his image, and the devil is working around the clock to destroy us and craft us, put us, mold us into the image of the world. I've said it before, I'll say it again, we're in a battle. A battle that is raging between Christ and Satan, and it's all about worship. Christ is desperate to save us, and Satan is desperate to take us down. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, Do you not know that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells where, church? In you and in me. We need proper rest, exercise, water, sunshine, good food. I'm not talking about a fanatical diet. I'm talking about a healthful diet, a healthful lifestyle. You see, I'm a believer that if we put good things into the body, if we put good things into our mind, it's going to be much easier to get good things out. While the opposite's true, if you sit down and watch all those sitcoms, if you sit and eat all the junk food, you ever watch people's grocery carts as they're coming out of Walmart? Man, I'm just sometimes puzzled by it. Wow. It's like meat and meat and meat and meat and cheese and this and that. I mean, it's just nothing but cholesterol, fat, this and that. It's like no wonder the cardiologists are busting at the seams. Man, they're, <laughs> they're doing well. <laughs> no wonder the cancer doctors and everybody else. It's no wonder. The bottom line is, is that when we feel bad, when our mind is sick, we don't feel like doing anything. Not anything. I feel like sitting in the chair. I was just talking to a little lady today who's lost her husband. Actually, it almost made me late for the service over here, but I just couldn't walk away. And she said, you know, I sat in my pajamas all day long in the dark, crying. I'm like, you've got to get out and, and, and get some help. You've got to go see somebody. You, you need to do something here. Don't sit in your home and watch that stuff that comes on the TV. Don't go and fill your body up full of the food the world has to offer. God's got a plan. We've got a health message, church. What's really shocking to me is other churches are beginning to teach it more than we do. It makes me sick. But we've got a health message. To drive home the point of how serious this issue is, Paul doesn't mince any words. Look at the next verse of 1 Corinthians 3. If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will do what? Destroy him, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you and I are. But the good news is, even if we haven't been living up to God's standard, even if we haven't been doing it, we can change. 
We can make decided changes. We don't have to throw ourselves away and just go on with the flow. Today can be a day of decision. But if you make a change, if you make a decision, tell somebody about it who's going to hold you accountable. Don't just make it in your mind and assume you're going to keep it. It probably won't last long. God doesn't even ask us to go and fix ourselves by ourselves. He says, no, I'll give you the will. I'll give you the power. I'll walk with you every step of the way in this change process. You know, for years, that's another thing, I'll be honest, I was turned off by the health message. Mm -hmm. Because the people who were preaching it and teaching it were kooky crazy. (laughs) They wouldn't admit it, they wouldn't say it, but they were just oozing with, if I eat good enough, Jesus is going to save me. If I exercise just the right way and I'm faithful with it, Jesus is going to save me. That's a lie. It's not true. That kind of unbalanced teaching and lifestyle turns people off. I know a conference official, he doesn't work in this conference, who said, I would be, I would live the health message if it wasn't for the kooky crazy people. (laughs) He's not even a vegetarian because of that. He's so determined to defy that kind of crazy unbalanced lifestyle that he's still eating all the stuff he would have done before. It turns people off. Don't allow unbalanced people to turn you off to God's plan. Embrace it, but do so in a healthy and balanced way. Finally, giving God our best means giving him the best we've got to give him. Sounds a little redundant, but that's okay. Let's look at verses 9 through 11. But now entreat God's favor, that he may be gracious to us while this is being done by your hands. Will he accept you favorably? Says the Lord of hosts. Who is there even among you who would shut the doors so so, so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain? Have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from your hands. For from the rising of the sun, even to its going down, my name shall be what? Great among the Gentiles. In every place, incense shall be offered to my name and a pure offering. What kind of offering, church? A pure offering. For my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. You know, I found that when I'm playing with my daughter, I guess I can admit I play baby dolls with my daughter sometimes. I think I'm supposed to do that. But when I play with my daughter, she always gives me the baby doll she doesn't really want. (laughs) She takes the good stuff and says, here, you take this. And if we're playing cars... She takes the car that's all pimped out and got the stripes and good looking and, no, Daddy, you're going to play with this car. The one with the roof caved in and smashed up and scratched up. But I've done an experiment. I found that if I begin pumping my car up or my baby doll up, man, this is the best one. You don't understand. This is the good stuff. (laughs) She takes it back. She wants it back for herself. Now, she doesn't do that every single time, but most of the time. And you know what, church? That's human nature. That is human nature. The priests were clearly offering God something, but it wasn't their best. It wasn't even close to being second best. Again, for a sacrifice to be a sacrifice, it requires self-denial. Self-denial. Is it any wonder that God asked for the best of everything, the best of our money? I told you before, we've returned that first 10%. Who does that money belong to? It's God's money. We haven't given him anything. It's already his. In fact, the only thing we've done is avoided from stealing from him. Because if we use it for ourselves, we're just taking what belongs to God 
and using it for me. To give an offering to God, we have to delve into that 90% that's left. That 90% piece that's left, and God doesn't even specify an amount. He says, whatever you want to do, however you've been blessed, do that. But I believe God wants our best. I believe he wants our best. We give God our best in our giving. We give God our best by presenting our bodies to him in the best possible condition. Ready for service. Dedicated. Devoted to God. We give God the best of our time. Hope you start the day spending time with God in his word. You know, I had a, my head deacon at my last church told me he would go to bed at like 6 or 7 o'clock at night. I thought he was crazy. I said, 6 or 7 o'clock? Really? But he would get up at 3 or 4 in the morning. And he said, Mike, that is the best time of the day. Nobody bothers me. I got time alone with God. I can spend copious amounts of time. I can talk to God. I can, I can do anything. It's the best time of the day. I'm not suggesting you'd start doing that. I'm not going to. <laughs> At least not that early. But God wants the best of our time. He wants time with you and with me daily. Time in His Word. Time in prayer. And then, He wants the Sabbath with you and with me. The best. The day the world is using to do all the fun stuff. To have the yard sales, to have the carnivals, to have this, to have that. God says, no, that's my day. I want you to keep it reserved for me. Only me. You know, in our neighborhood where we used to live, they had a yard sale every year. And for the first two or three, four years, I think two or three years, the only day that yard sale was almost Sabbath. <laughs> you couldn't even hardly get out of the neighborhood. There were so many people walking around, and I had a lot of junk. I'm thinking, wow, that would be great to unload some of that junk. <laughs> couldn't do it. That's God's day. That's God's time. There may be a thousand yard sellers out there who would buy every thing I've got but that's God's day it's holy sacred time God wants the best the very best God wants the best of our worship as well God wants to be so far out in front that by comparison there's not even a second place you know how we always put things in order. It's, my, it's God, it's my family, it's this and that and that and this. And then I come last. No, God says, I want to be so far out in front, there's not even a second. God wants the best in everything. Everything. No leftovers, no seconds. He wants the best. We run into serious problems when we allow God to slip down to to second place. Because if God ever slips to second place, you can bet he's on his way to third. And then fourth. And then fifth until he's almost off the chart. You can't see God. God speaks to us, but we can't see him. We live in a world that's full of things we can see. We have to... Keep God first. We have to keep our eyes on God. You know, this is uh, Jewel and Britton's mom getting the nursery ready for Levi. Trying to go above and beyond to get ready for that little man to show up. We're very excited about that. But I can remember back when Jewel was on the way. They were so excited, didn't know what to expect. You know, this little person's coming into our lives and, and, you know, we're trying to get the best of everything. (laughs) Go out and get a brand new changing table. Go out and get this, get that. 
oh, you know, hey, we're looking at these two strollers, but this one costs less, but that one's got a couple extra features. The baby would probably, yeah, let's get that one. We're trying to get the best. Problem is we're not rich. <laughs> we can't get, always get the best. But the spirit, the attitude is there. Why do we do this? We do it because we love our kids. In fact, I know there's some of you sitting here today listening to my voice that have or will bankrupt your checking account. You'll put everything on the line you've got for your kids. Am I lying? I don't think so. The affections of our hearts show up in tangible ways. That old saying, put your money where your mouth is, is true. Does God get that kind of treatment from you? Does he get that kind of treatment from me? I can see where I've fallen short. I can see where I've put other things bef before him. Little, silly, stupid things. But nonetheless, I put them before him. If you know that something in your life is ahead of God, that God is taking a back seat to anything, please don't leave here today without making a commitment to change that, to reverse the priority, to make drastic sweeping changes in your life. Ask God to forgive you. Don't just assume it's okay and then say, I'm going to do better. No, go to God and repent. Say, I'm sorry. I want to do better about this. I don't want to put anything before you. But today can be the turning point. Today can be the day when it all changes. We say it often, sometimes it's cliche, that we believe Jesus is coming soon. I believe it. I hope you believe it. But our Jesus is so awesome. He's so far and above anything and everything we have around us. How could we even think of not giving him the best? He deserves it. Let's ensure that he's got first place in everything. In every way in our lives. Every way possible. Let's not let anything crowd him out. Giving him the very best that we can offer him. If you do, if I do, we won't be sorry. Because he'll be so close. We'll be so fulfilled. We'll be so joyful and happy. We won't even look back at the things of the world. Amen.
We did not come here for ourselves. We came here for you. You've called us together. You've called us together for a special plan and purpose. Lord, I pray that day by day, as we keep you first, as we put you before everything else, I pray we'll grow ever closer to you until we're transformed into your image wonder today with every head bowed and every eye closed, there's someone here who realizes that maybe God has not been receiving your best. Maybe you'd like to raise your hand up towards heaven and say, God, I want to give you my best. Help me with that. Praise God. Lord God, we have the desire in our hearts, but admit that our promises are like ropes of sand. They don't go very far sometimes. So Lord, we're asking that you show up and provide the will, the power, the might, that you walk with us every step of the way until that day when you can say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. That's our desire. That's our greatest hope, Lord. We pray to that end today. In the name of Jesus, all the people say, 